Chapter 8 is Internal Control and Cash. So first we're going to talk about Sarbanes-Oxley. And Sarbanes-Oxley was a U.S. law enacted to foster public confidence and trust in financial reporting of companies, as well as prevent fraud, theft, and financial scandals. And this was enacted after the bankruptcy of Enron and some other companies. Basically, they had a lot of fraudulent accounting practices, and a lot of people lost a lot of money when they went bankrupt. So Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted to restore trust in the financial reporting of companies. And what it requires companies to do is maintain what's called effective internal control. So they want to make sure that companies are accu- accurately reporting their um, financial statements. They want to make sure management of the company is uh, sound and trustworthy, etc. So a more thorough definition of internal control is the procedures and processes used by a company to first, safeguard its assets, second, process information accurately, and third, ensure compliance with laws and regulations. So that is basically what Sarbanes-Oxley is trying to promote. It's trying to promote effective internal control. So just to go over that in more detail, the three objectives once again are first to ensure assets are safeguarded for business purposes. So assets are valuable. You want to make sure they are safe, secure. You know what they're worth. You're making sure they're protected and used appropriately. Second, you want to ensure that business information is accurate, and that's both for your own purposes, so you know it's a, you as management know what's happening with the company, but also for any investors, creditors, they all want your business information to be accurate as well. And then third, uh, for to ensure employees and managers comply with laws and regulations. So basically to ensure that they're in compliance with Sarbanes-Oxley and other acts like that. So those are the objectives of internal control. Now we're going to go over the actual elements of internal control. So how do we maintain effective internal control? There are five elements that we're going to be discussing. The first is called the control environment. And this refers to the overall attitude of management and employees about the importance of controls. So obviously, if management says, we don't care what you have to do, just make sure earnings increase next quarter, that's probably not going to create the best and most trustworthy environment that'll probably promote manipulation, um, fraudulent activities, etc. So the control environment is focused on management philosophy and operating style. You want to make sure management stresses the uh, importance of maintaining effective internal control, reporting accurately, um, having ethical interactions, etc. It also refers to the organizational structure, so the hierarchy in the organization. Do employees feel comfortable saying something to management when they think uh, there's an issue, etc., and then various personnel policies. So that covers the control environment. Second, we have risk assessment. So this is identifying risks, analyzing their significance, and working to minimize them. So this is external. It's what are external risks to your business, um, how likely are they, how important are they, and then working to minimize them. And risk assessment is often confused with monitoring, which I'll go over in a second, but this is external. So keep that in mind when we go to risk, uh, when we go to monitoring next. So our third internal control uh, element is control procedures. So there are a lot of them. This is probably one of the more important elements. So the first is having competent personnel, rotating duties, and mandatory vacations. In the chapter, it discusses a worker who's never missed a day in like 10 years, and he's sick one day, so someone takes over his work for him and looks at it, and they realize he's been stealing lots of money from the company. So having mandatory vacations, having rotating duties where employees check each other's work, and having competent personnel is all important for maintaining an effective internal control environment. 
Um, second, we have separating responsibilities for related operations, and this uh, ties nicely with separating operations, custody of assets, and accounting. So the person who accepts the money should not be the person to report the money in the accounting records because they could easily say, I received $500 when they really received 600 and then take that $100 for themselves. And then third, uh, the last one is proofs and security measures. So as you can see, in, uh, control procedures are quite important uh, and there's a lot to it. So I would recommend just reading that section of the chapter so you're clear on all of them. Then we have monitoring. So this is locating weaknesses and improving your controls. So whereas risk assessment was external, this is internal. So you should be looking at all of your um, control procedures, everything else, the control environment, and looking for weaknesses, seeing if there are things wrong, things that could be improved, and working to fix them. And the last element is information and communication. This just joins everything together. It's used by management to improve. So listening to employees and what they think about the control procedures or um, talking to other members of the management team and seeing what they can do better uh, to lead the organization, etc. There are some limitations uh, to internal control. There's first the human element. People will make mistakes no matter what, so you have to consider that. And there's also cost-benefit considerations. So you could be really overbearing as management and watch your employees' every move to make sure nothing fraudulent happens, but your employees probably won't appreciate that. Uh, it's also costly for you to have uh, have to do that. So cost-benefit analysis and considerations are also uh, some limitations. Okay. So we're going to be focusing on cash in this chapter because cash is the asset most likely to be stolen or used improperly in a business. The chapter goes into a lot of detail on all sorts of measures to control cash. So it talks about like a cash register and how you would use that uh, and things like that. I'm just going to highlight uh, what I think is important here and I'm going to focus on just electronic funds transfers or EFTs. So these are some reasons why you might use an EFT. Uh, first, it costs less than receiving cash payments because it's a direct transfer. You don't have to write a check, send the check, have someone cash it, um, and vice versa. So it costs less. It enhances internal controls because cash is received directly by the bank without any employee interference. So if the employees are not involved, that takes out that human element that could um, skim some money off the top or something like that. So it enhances internal controls. And EFTs also reduce late payments because it could be set up so every first of the month a payment is made directly. You don't need to remember to do it. It'll just be taken directly out of your account. So EFTs are pretty important and they help with cash control. Another thing that helps with cash control is bank accounts. So companies use bank accounts for internal control. And obviously there aren't that many alternatives because if a company has a lot of money, you're not just going to keep it uh, somewhere. You're going to keep it in the bank for protection, security. You earn some interest on it, etc. Another main reason is because banks provide an independent recording of cash transactions. So you know what's happening with your money, but the banks also know what's happening with your money and they keep track of it. So a bank statement is a summary of all checking account transactions made available every month. And it's going to show the beginning balance. It's going to show additions and deductions throughout the period. And it's going to then show you an ending balance. So a total summary of your transactions during the period, uh, during the month. Uh, it's also important to note that the company's checking account balance in the bank records is a liability um, because the bank owes their customer that money back whenever the customer demands it. So it's a liability for the bank. And for this reason, the company the company's account has a credit balance. So just keep that in mind uh, as we continue moving on with the chapter. Okay, 
So now to discuss credit memos and debit memos, which are going to be very important when we go into our discussion of a bank reconciliation. So a credit memo represents an increase in cash. So anything that increases cash will be a credit memo. That could include deposits made by electronic funds transfers. It could be collection of notes receivables, collection of interest. It could be proceeds for a loan, um, interest earned from the bank on the company account, anything like that. So anything that increases cash is going to be a credit memo. On the other hand, a debit memo represents a decrease in cash. So this could be payments made by electronic funds transfer. It could be service charges. So you owe the bank a certain amount of money every month or year for holding on to your money, storing it, keeping track of it. So that's a service charge. It could also be NSF checks. So NSF checks uh, stands for non-sufficient funds. And that is when a check is canceled and returned without payment. So that's almost like a bounce check. So if I received a check from my customer, I go to cash it, and the bank says you can't cash it. That customer actually has no money in their account. I thought I was going to be getting paid, but I'm actually not going to because there's no money in the account. That's an NSF check. So all of those together represent debit memos. So we have credit memos. Uh, increasing cash, and debit memos, decreasing cash. And those are going to be used in our bank reconciliation. So a bank reconciliation is an analysis of the items and amounts that result in the cash balance reported in the bank statement to be different from the balance of the cash account in the company's ledger. So at the end of the period, when we're looking at our bank statement and we're looking at our cash balance and our ledger, they're going to be different. And we need to go through this reconciling process in order to adjust them and make sure they're the same. So a bank reconciliation will have three sections. It'll have the bank section, a company section, and then you're going to adjust both sections and have an adjusted balance at the end for each one. So you'll go through your bank section and get an adjusted balance. You'll go through the through your company section and get an adjusted balance. And at the end, these adjusted balances need to be equal. They need to be the same number. So if you're going through and you're doing one and you're getting two different numbers for your adjusted balances, something is wrong. So you need to reevaluate because they need to be equal. That's the point of it. You need to make sure that um, whatever adjusting, whatever adjustments you're making are resulting in the same final balance for your bank side and your company side. And I'll go through an example of this uh, later on. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through kind of like the steps or the formula for each section, and then we'll do an example. So starting with the bank section, this one's a little bit more straightforward. You are going to start with the cash balance according to the bank. And the cash balance according to the bank is whatever the ending cash balance is on your bank statement. So that's where you get that value from. You start with the value of cash, um, the ending value of cash on your bank statement. Then we are going to add any deposits not recorded by the bank. And these are known as deposits in transit. So this happens when maybe you as the company know you just performed uh, a service or you provided a product and you know you're getting paid for it, but the check it, and you reported it on your records, you reported that, um, You made the sale, you're getting the cash for it, but the bank doesn't know yet. So they haven't received the check yet, so they don't have it in their record. So you need to adjust for that on the bank side. So you are adding deposits in transit, not recorded by the bank. Then you're going to deduct any outstanding checks that have not been paid by the bank. So similar idea, the company knows they just wrote a check Uh, for some sort of expense, but it's not been cashed yet, so the bank doesn't know that that's going to be an outflow of cash. So again, you need to go in and adjust that on the bank side. So end of the process would just be determining the adjusted balance. So what you're going to do is take your uh, cash balance according to the bank, add deposits in transit, deduct outstanding checks, and then you get your adjusted balance. 
and you're going to hold on to that for now because then we're going to do the company section and get the adjusted balance for that and then they should be equal. But these are the steps for the bank section. Now we have the company section. So the company section is a little bit more involved. We are going to start with the cash balance according to the company ledger. This is also sometimes referred to as the cash balance according to the books. So the ledger or the books, both of those mean your company section cash balance. Then, if you remember we talked about earlier, credit memos and debit memos, we are going to add any credit memos that have not been recorded. So these can be things like notes receivables collected by the bank, interest collected, all the things I went over earlier, um, anything that represents an increase in cash. Then, so I'll just write that. This is going to be any increases in cash. Then you are going to deduct debit memos that have not been recorded. So that could be NSF checks. You thought you were getting paid. You probably increased the money on, in your cash journals, but then you find out that the check bounced and you didn't actually get the money. So that's a decrease in cash. And then bank service charges. You usually don't have that recorded in your books because you don't know about it until you get the bank statement. Uh, so a bank service charge would also represent a deduction. So your debit memos are all of your decreases in cash. So after you do that, you start with your cash balance according to books, add the credit memos, deduct the debit memos, you get your adjusted balance. And I'll go through the example, but your adjusted balance for your company section needs to match the adjusted balance for the bank section. And they need to be equal. And then one other point to make, which I'll go over in the example, is the company's records do need to be updated for any items in the company section of the bank reconciliation using journal entries. So anything that happens in the company side, you need to update accordingly in your journal. So if there's a bank service charge, you need to count that as an expense and a reduction in cash. If there is interest collected, you need to report that as well. So I'll go through that, but you just need to keep in mind that you do journalize the company section. You don't journalize the bank section. Okay, so this is a more simple example. Then we'll do a full bank reconciliation statement, but this is just like a multiple choice for chapter eight. So it says, ABC company gathered the following reconciling items in preparing its May bank reconciliation. Calculate the adjusted cash balance per books on May 31st. So this is asking us what the value is for the company section. Um, cash balance per books is company section. If it said, uh, otherwise it would have said cash balance uh, for the bank or based off of the bank statement value, something like that. So we're doing the company side right now. So what are we going to do for the company section? We know we start with our cash balance per books. So that is going to be $5,400. Then we know we need to add any credit memos. So credit memos would include notes receivable and interest collected by the bank. So we're going to add 650. And then I don't see any other credit memos here. So we're going to deduct any debit memos. Debit memos would include the bank charge for check printing. That's like a service charge, so minus 40. And it would also include this NSF check here. So uh, we thought we earned money, but it actually turns out that the check had, the account owner had insufficient funds, so we didn't actually get paid. So that's a reduction in cash for us, so we're going to subtract 140. So since this is the company side, we're not doing anything with deposits in transit because that would have been done on the bank side. And we're also not doing anything with outstanding checks because that also would have been on the bank side. We're only focusing on company side uh, elements. So that is your cash balance per books, credit memos like notes receivable and interest collected by the bank, and debit memos like bank service charges and NSF checks. So if we do all this, this is our initial value plus any adjustments that gets us our final adjusted balance of 
5,870. So that is going to be A, and that would be our adjusted balance for the company section. And if we'd done it for the bank section and we had the uh, balance according to the bank uh, statement at the end of the period, we should get that same value on the bank side. Okay, so now we're going to do a longer example. We're going to work through a full bank reconciliation statement. So it tells us that the bank statement for company X indicates a balance of $7,735 on June 30th. So this is the starting bank balance. That is the balance according to the bank statement. It tells us after the journals for June had been posted, the cash account had a balance of $4,098. So this is our company balance, the cash balance according to the books. Oops. Okay. Then it says, prepare a bank reconciliation on the basis of the following reconciling items. So we have cash sales of 742 had been erroneously recorded in the cash journals as 724. As A, we have B, deposits in transit not recorded by the bank for 425. C is a bank debit memo for service charges for 35. D is a bank credit memo for note collected by the bank for, of 2000 and. $475, including 75 interest. So that 75 is already included in there. Um, e, we have a bank debit memo for an NSF check for $256. And F, we have checks outstanding of $1,860. So based off all of that, we're going to do a full bank reconciliation statement, and I'm going to show you it now. So we are going to start by saying this is our bank reconciliation for June 30th. And we're going to start with the bank section right here at the top. So with the bank section, we know we start with our cash balance according to the bank statement. To the bank statement. And we know that this is that $7,735 up here. So we write that down first. This is going to be 7000 $735. Then we are going to add any deposits in transit not recorded by the bank. So we're going to be adding deposits in transit. And if we look up above, we know that we had deposits in transit not recorded by the bank of $425. So we are going to add that. Then we are going to deduct any outstanding checks. So if we again look above, we see that we have checks outstanding of 1860 right here. So we are going to subtract that, 1,860. And then that handles the bank side. We are going to figure out our adjusted balance. And that is going to be the 7,735 plus 425 minus 1,860. And we get 6,300 as our adjusted balance. And, whoops, that's not double underlying, there we go. That's our adjusted balance for the bank section. Now we are going to do the company section. 
So the company section is going to be what we went over earlier. And we are going to start with the cash balance according to books this time. So that value is going to be our $4,098. So we're going to start up top with 4098 Then we are going to add uh, any credit memos. So if we look above, we see that we are going to have first... Um, a bank credit memo for a note collected by the bank for 2475 and that's already including the interest, so we don't need to make a separate entry for that. So we are going to add a note collected for um, $2,475. Also, we have to look up and see, so there are no, there's nothing else that's listed as a credit memo, but we do have this error up here. An error can occur anywhere. It could be on the bank side or the company side. It could be an increase or a decrease, so you need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. In this case, you know what's on the company side because it says it happened in the cash journal, so that rules out it being in the bank section. Now you need to determine, is it an increase in cash or a decrease in cash? So it tells us that Cash sales of 742 had been erroneously recorded in the cash journal as 724. So what that means is you actually earn $742 in cash and in sales, but you only recorded it as 724. So that means right now your journals are um, 742 minus 724, so $18 too low. So you need to increase cash by $18 to make sure your journals are accurate. So how we do that, that is going to be on the addition side. So we're going to add our note collected and we're also going to add this error. So we're going to add $18. Next, we finished all of our additions. Now we're going to do deductions. So we are going to be deducting any debit memos. So we are going to deduct um, the bank debit memo for service charges for $35. So that is going to be right here. Um, a bank service charge. And we are also going to deduct this bank debit memo for an NSF check. So that is going to be right here for 256. So now we've handled everything on this list. We should have our adjusted balance for the company section. So our adjusted balance is going to be the 4,098 we started with, plus 2,475, plus 18, minus 35, minus 256, and that is going to get us $6,300. So we know that we did our bank reconciliation correctly because we have $6,300 here and $6,300 here. Um, so this is all correct. Your final step, as I mentioned before, is to journalize the company section. So what do I mean by that? I mean that these are all things you need to adjust in your um, accounts, and you're doing it on this bank reconciliation, but you also need to update your journals. So we are going to have four entries, one for the note collected, one for the error, one for the bank service charge, and one for the NSF check. So this is on June 30th. These transactions are all going to be on 6.30. And we're just going to go down one by one. So for our notes receivable, 
We had a note collected by the bank, including $75 of interest for $2,475. So what that means is it was a credit memo. Cash is increasing for us. Cash is always going to be involved in these journal entries because that's literally what you're doing. You're adjusting the cash balances. So for that first case of the notes receivables, cash is going to increase by $2,475 because that note was collected. That means you get paid your cash and the note is taken off your books. So cash is debited for $2,475 and the note receivable is going to be credited for um the note receivable is going to be credited for 2475 because it was paid off it's no longer on your books we're crediting it to get rid of it so that handles the note receivable the error in recording cash sales is also an addition so cash is going to be increasing what happened there was cash sales of 242 were reported as uh, so, uh, sorry, cash sales of 742 were reported as 724. So that means cash is too low by $18. So what we need to do is debit cash to increase it by $18. And we also need to debit, uh, we need to credit sales for $18. Because that was a full journal entry we messed up. Originally we had cash debited for 724 and sales debit credited for 724 it should have been cash debited for 742 and sales credited for 742 so we're making up for the difference there so these our uh these are our credit memos that we updated now we need to do the debit memos so in both of these first cases, cash was increasing, so cash was being debited and something else was happening on the credit side. Now for the debit memos, cash is going to be credited and decreasing and something is happening on our debit side. So the first thing was that NSF check. So when you have an NSF check, you presumably wrote off an accounts receivable, said, okay, cool, they paid me and you increased cash. Now you have to go back and reverse that because you found out that the check didn't go through so you actually weren't paid. So you're going to reinstate an accounts receivable and um, lower your cash balance. So the NSF check entry is going to be accounts receivable is debited for the amount of the NSF check, so 256. And cash is credited for 256. So you're reinstating an accounts receivable because now that person owes you money again, their check didn't go through, and you decrease your cash balance. And the last step is the bank service charge. So that's just an expense. So all you would do would be bank service expense is going to be debited for the $35, debit to increase, and cash is going to be credited for the $35. So these are your two debit memos. And as you notice, cash is decreasing in both cases uh, because we are crediting it. So this is cash increase and this is cash decrease. And these are our, these are your um, company journal entries. So we updated everything for the company side and we don't touch the bank side. So that is all we did. We took the we took all this information, we created a bank reconciliation statement, made sure our adjusted balances were equal, and then we journalized the company section. So that's pretty much all there is to it for chapter eight. Um, a lot of material, I'd say the highlight is the bank reconciliation statement, but you should also focus on all the internal control elements, etc. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out and I hope you have a great rest of your day.